going through a vote uh, during the uh, um, during an election year. Uh, and you know, regardless of all of that, they pushed it through uh, and they made they made it happen. And so it's unprecedented. It uh, calls into question, I think, the legitimacy of, of it all. But at the end of the day, they control the Senate and Mitch McConnell's, you know, the chair of the, uh, or is the, is the majority leader and, um, and, uh, and they made it happen. So uh, unfortunately, that's, that's the way our system works. <laughs> well, Nick, I gotta, I gotta ask you then. Um, I mean, we, we've heard quite a bit about uh, court packing here and, and Democrats have gotten a lot of criticism about it. But in, in relation to what you just said, it seems as though the Republicans have been working on this for years, yeah. with the local level and the federal level. Um, talk a little bit about that and how that relates to kind of, you know, there's this democratic idea that's, that's bubbled up about court packing. So mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll take the first part of that question too, um, or the second part, I guess, about you know how Republicans have been working on this. Uh, you know, they have focused really, I think, ruthlessly at building their power at the state and local level, as well as in the courts. Uh, and you're seeing the results of both right now in our politics. Uh, in the early '80s, they formed something called the Federalist Society, which I, you know, many of you have heard of. Um, it's been in the work since 1980. They have about 70,000 active participants. They now have 200 chapters in law schools around the country. Uh, this guy named Leonard Leo is the executive vice president of, of the Federalist Society. And um, he's a, a Republican operative that has been the advisor to many presidents uh, uh, on judicial confirmations and nominations. And in between 2014 and 2017 alone, he was able to raise $250 million for, yeah. their, um, for their efforts at the Federalist Society. And uh, you know, uh, Democrats have a counterpart, it's called the American Constitution Society, but their budget uh, as of like a couple of years ago was $6 million. So that tells you about a little bit about where our focus is as Democrats and where uh, Republicans have been really investing. And um, I know we'll get into this a little bit later as well, but they partner and they built a bunch of aligned organizations that help reinforce their messages around, around confirmation. So Americans for Prosperity, the National Rifle Association, the Christian uh, Right, all of those entities and many, many more all sort of um, collaborate to push through uh, these, these nominees and not only at the Supreme Court level, but all of the lower courts as well. And they've, uh, you know, for the last two decades, really, really invested time and energy in pushing um, that agenda forward. And you're seeing the results of that now with a 6-3 control of the Supreme Court, uh, a domination of lower courts, uh, and, um, and, you know, sort of leaving Democrats behind in that regard. So uh, that's the context that we're working um, uh, under and why they've been so successful, I believe. Uh, and, you know, to your point about court pa packing, I think it, you know, it obviously cuts uh, <laughs> a number of different ways. And, and uh, you know, I think that there are a number of different schools of thought on this. And I personally struggle as well because me as a, you know, sort of someone who is partisan, who, you know, thinks Democrats don't fight <laughs> hard enough uh, and, and don't really know how to fight. Uh, you know, if we have control, just like they have control, why not uh, push through? The initial, um, uh, the initial sort of uh, number of justices was designed to be reflective of, um, of the circuit courts. And uh, at some point it stopped at nine, but we have, I think 13 circuits now. Uh, so why not uh, go to where, it, where uh, it was sort of originally designed? Republicans in states, uh, I think they're in, in, I believe 11 states have pushed forward legislation to increase the number of, of people on their state Supreme Courts to try to balance the power. So they've set the precedent. Um, and in addition, like I had mentioned against that backdrop, they've been spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to pack courts 
uh, up and down um, the entire system. So, you know, I, it's not like this hasn't been done or hasn't been talked about. It just hasn't been talked about on the left. And so, you know, I, I think it's smart of uh, Joe Biden to form a committee to take a look at this uh, and a bipartisan committee to take a look at this and then make a decision based on that, based on all of the facts, some of the stuff I just said. And, um, you know, we can see whether what is the best for the democracy and our country uh, at the end of that process. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Hey, Christine, how are you? Oh, I think very so. well. Thank you. A couple Excellent. technical difficulties, but I'm here now. Oh, hey, you're, Christine. You're Hi. I experience about six a day myself. So, <laughs> well, Christine, I want to get you in on this conversation too, uh, in terms of court packing. And, and we were kind of talking about the hypocrisy of court packing as, as Republicans have kind of attempted to take the high road on this, uh, so to speak. So, so please speak a little bit to that and a little bit to why it makes sense for Democrats to consider it. Well, I think it's, you're talking about court representation. So let's take a step back. You want to talk about packing um, that doesn't really uh, make that that doesn't really fully describe what we're talking about. And I would also put out a word of caution that you also don't want to be a victim of your own success. Let me explain. I think that Joe Biden was very smart, I'll echo my colleague, in saying uh, that he would have a uh, nonpartisan commission to look at all of that because you really have to look at it from three categories. The first is the district level courts. I actually worked when I was a deputy city attorney in San Francisco where we had some federal cases. The first district of Northern California sits in San Francisco. You have trials in San Francisco and Oakland, but a juror or a litigant could be from very North um, California and have to come in every day. So if you were gonna add, for example, um, district level court seats, you'd have to account for uh, rural California, rural America, because most of these seats uh, are in like the county seat or they're in the, the state capital of a particular state or territory or entity. So that's what I mean by victims of our own success. It doesn't necessarily mean you'd have uh, by having more judges. And if the judges were to be drawn from pools of people who live somewhere and practice in the area, you could end up with more um, conservative district level judges, but at least you'd have representation. So I think the representation from a geographical standpoint um, in terms of access to the courts um, is really important. And at the district level, you'd also want to look at um, the issue, and Joe Biden has brought this up from when he was vice president, the issue of who sits on the courts. He would often say that he was the only state school person in the in the Oval Office meetings with President Obama. You'd have all these people that went to Ivy League schools that would try to come in and try to convince the president of something. And every now and then they'd sort of take a dig at Joe Biden for not knowing their network of people because um, you know, he didn't go to an Ivy League school. That's not who he was. He knew the Senate institution. So we think of him as an establishment guy. But remember, he um, went to a state school and his wife, uh, the wonderful Dr. Jill Biden teaches uh, community college. And so he'd say, well, wait a second, why are we only drawing our talent from the Ivy Leagues, right? Why aren't we drawing from state schools? And I say this as a University of California, San Francisco law school grad, you know, why not the state schools, right? So it's not just looking at the courts from the standpoint of who lives there, but looking at it from a representation standpoint, um, particularly from a race standpoint, but also looking at the diversity of who even gets gets even their name forwarded to these judicial review committees that every U.S. senator in the country puts together so that they can have, then have a legal team that's doing the vetting to decide whom they would pass forward to the administration um, of either party. So again, we have to sort of deconstruct to reconstruct. What are the courts there for? If they're there for redress, then we should make sure that they are um, allowing redress for all the people. And that might be a, a population count. If they're for all the people, you have to do a diversity count to show the, the diversity of the people, not only in terms of race and ethnicity and LGBTQ status, but also in terms of their education. Right, and where we draw these people from, because it's a very, very, very uh, big difference. When I was a young attorney practicing, starting out in the San Francisco City Attorney's Office, for any of you who are old enough to have watched LA Law, but that was a, uh, a, TV, a TV show. At the beginning of every show, they had Jimmy Smits and, and uh, Corbin Benson and others. And so at the beginning of every show, they'd have a little meeting of who was doing what case, right? And so um, we used to call those our LA law meetings for about 
20 minutes a day, you'd start off your day in a staff meeting and say, who's got this case? Who knows that judge? Who knows this defense attorney? Who knows this plaintiff's attorney? Just so that if you were going in as a line um, attorney representing the city of County of San Francisco, you at least had the knowledge of everybody uh, who had practiced for the city and county of San Francisco. So you could ground yourself in, in the information. And chances were that those people, they knew these people either because they had sued the city before or more likely because they had gone to the same schools, they had socialized in the same places, they knew each other in those spaces. So if you were, you know, maybe a young white woman like me, I literally had an attorney say to me, most of these judges, most of these senior attorneys, they treat women as either wives, daughters, or exes. You would be smart to fit in the daughter category. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, they said, just calm down, see what we're talking about. But if you're black, if you're queer, if you're Asian or Latina, then you're not gonna be seen as a wife, ex, or daughter of um, these older white judges. So again, the practice of law, what is the point? The point is to achieve justice. You've got to have more diversity of experience because if you don't, then you, even when you do get diversity, we're told pigeonhole yourself into a relationship that these people can understand. So they're going to give you a listen and therefore your client a fair day in court. So that's one thing. The second level is the appellate level. And that's where Justice Barrett comes from, uh, albeit briefly. I mean, come on. Any, and let just be clear, she's never tried a case and she's never been in a courtroom. So anybody in America who had jury duty has more court experience than Amy Barrett. Let's just be clear about that, okay? So congratulations, if you sat on a jury for jury duty or if you testified in a court of law for any reason, even traffic court, you have more judicial courtroom experience than in interaction than Amy Coney Barrett. But here's where we are. So look at the appellate justices. Again, where do they come from? Do they come from people who were in the rough and tumble of the courtroom? Or did they come from people who only taught law? I love my law school professors, most of them anyway, but the fact of the matter is the ones we respected were the ones who had been in the arena somewhere. You know, not just the guy that wrote the textbook, that's great, and it was mostly guy, although we had one woman who wrote the Civ Pro textbooks, but where did they come from? Where did they get this experience? So again, what are you drawing from? And again, what do those appellate circuits look like? And then we get to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court. Now, when we look at size, I think it's important to note, for example, that we're not talking about a binary choice, fight or don't fight, you know, expand it or retract it. What we're looking at is, does it represent America? For right. example, they expanded the court because they were expanding the number of circuits that they had. And so therefore every circuit was supposed to have a Supreme Court justice assigned to that circus. And when you go to law circuit, when you go to law school, they'll say, this is the judge assigned to that circuit, and this was you know, the decisions that they made. They still do not, that now, only Supreme Court justices get more than one circuit, and they, they, in some cases, trade them around. So again, if we have 13 circuits, why wouldn't you have 13 Supreme Court justices? That seems an easy, an easy one to me. But again, just to sum up, yes, you should have representation. It should talk about population. It should talk about diversity, not only of life experience and legal experience, but diversity of um, race and gender and sexual orientation and identity. You should also have uh, the ability to say, are we, are we accessing justice for people? Are we making decisions that reflect the lived experiences of the litigants? And third, if you're going to be making decisions on such a vast scale, on such a vast scale that affect the whole country, wouldn't you want to make sure that the law was being interpreted by people who were coming from yeah. a process that was far more little d democratic. I don't think that if you compare the hearings, for example, there's anything close to the Barrett hearing versus say the judge, just, the judge turned justice Ginsburg hearing in terms of the depth of the information that was, that was pursued, the depth of the answers that were received and the uh, dedication of time towards what qualifications the nominee had that would make them an empathic, intelligent justice. So I think the commission is good. I hope that it is broad and I hope that people understand that some of the answers that are drawn up might in fact um, also skew um, more expansively to rural America, which not had traditionally in recent years been democratic uh, 
big D Democratic Party, but so what? If it's the right thing to do and you're reflecting the whole country, then that's what you should do. Right. Uh, it's interesting you bring up process, Christine, because that segues nicely into my next question. Um, I want to talk a little bit about process. Uh, you brought up the process of, of the hearings when Ginsburg went through, Justice Ginsburg went through, as opposed to when Judge Barrett is going through. Uh, there's always been kind of an ideological divide between Democrats and Republicans when it's come to judicial appointments, but what was different about this time? Christine, let's, let's start with you. What was different about this process? Well, I think first of all, the fact that it came, it was very clear, President Trump was very clear about the fact that he was gonna draw his name from a pre-approved list of people that he had that were vetted by a small um, ideological society called the Federalist Society. Now that's fine. You know, a Democratic president could say, I'm gonna let the ACLU pick my judges, but why would you do that? Wouldn't you at least say, I have a list of judges that have come from a number of different places. All the stakeholders have weighed in and said, here's a group of people. Even the Republican party could have weighed in and said, you know, in all of our states, right? All those, all those US senators that have those judicial um, nomination committees could have said, here are some people who have bubbled up through the process. Now let's go to the top of that. So even in terms of the provenance of the list of possible individuals, what we were told was, Donald Trump has a list. Joe Biden should have a list. Well, first of all, why should Joe Biden have a list? We don't, we don't even know yet. I want him to be more broad based in his thinking because that's my whole point is that it's too elite. And I say this as a child of the establishment. If I'm telling you it's too establishment, trust me, it's too establishment. So number one, get a, get a more broad based list. Two, we were told Trump wanted to win Florida. So he wanted the Cuban American judge from Florida. That's what he wanted. And Mitch McConnell said, no, we want Amy Coney Barrett because it was very important to them. She can unify the party because she is a um, Catholic, Notre Dame, conservative, not much of a judicial footprint. <laughs> Again, no, <laughs> not much of a judicial footprint. So she'll be a unifying person. And there's something to be said for replacing a woman with a woman. And if you're going to overturn Roe versus Wade or contraception or something like that, do that through um, the, the hand of a Catholic woman. And they were very blunt that that was their plan. And I say that as a Catholic woman, that was their plan. And so that's what they did. Then they said, well, we're going to have a handful of days to talk about her. You didn't have, they didn't even bother going out and making the case to people about why she was better than somebody else. So you didn't even have the competition that you usually have. If anyone's seen the RBG documentary, which I highly recommend, any of them, you'll see how her husband, Marty, um, and Ginsburg made a big point of being a big advocate for Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg uh, because um, she wasn't as well known as some of the other people who, as President Clinton points out in the documentary, also had their people calling uh, for them. And so we didn't even see any of that. It was a simple thing of this is what we're doing. Mitch McConnell saying, this is what I want. This is the person I can get through. Give me the information. Then they had a very, very limited amount of time to question her. She was clear she wasn't gonna give any answers, wasn't gonna be candid, and wasn't even going to talk about the experiences that she did have on the bench. The, the, the decisions she did write, the law review articles that she did write, her whole, her questionnaire wasn't even complete. Her questionnaire wasn't even complete. And let me be clear about that. I was a presidential appointee. I had to turn in my uh, PS86 form. If my form wasn't complete, I wouldn't get the job. Yeah. And I know Jared Kushner has gotten to, you know, redo his several <laughs> times over the years, but Amy Barrett kept turning it in late. If one of her law students treated a term paper that way, they'd get an F. So I didn't like that process. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, everything Christine said is totally right. The other uh, thing I will just, you know, sort of remind people of is the uh, backdrop that this all was taking place uh, behind. We are like, you know, a few days away from the election. Uh, this was also the first time since 1869 that a justice was uh, confirmed with no bipartisan support. Even Joe Manchin supporters <laughs> held the line on this one. That was Edward uh -huh. Lincoln, Secretary of War. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, we have a pandemic happening. Uh, there is uh, um, uh, issues before the Supreme Court 
that um, you know I think are uh, especially timely and especially important. And going to Christine's um, point about diversity and who's on the court right now. And I know again we'll get more into this, but like you know it's a bunch of um, privileged people making decisions on people's health care on on who can get married or not, who can, um, you know, what's going to happen around the election. The other day, um, uh, Kavanaugh uh, cited Bush v. Uh, yeah, Bush v. Gore, which is just right. like insane. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's really problematic, not only the process, but the backdrop that this was all taking place under. And I think also calls into question sort of the legitimacy of it all. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Going, going from this, talking about process to kind of hopping over to talking about, you know, it's kind of in the same vein, how Senate Republicans refused to even provide Merrick Garland a hearing way back in, in Christine. <laughs> I can see Christine's face on this. I'm going to come to her first on this. Um, this was with about eight months left in his presidency, Nick. Um, yes. Do you think this, and this brought us into the current extreme era of partisanship we're in? And do you think there's any coming back from this? Christine, please, please start. Well, I was sighing deeply because I went to an RBG memorial and I was wearing a t-shirt and someone said, oh, is that new? And I said, no, I was actually wearing it to campaign for Merrick Garland. So I knew <laughs> like exactly how old my t-shirt was because I had pictures of myself in the streets. Now we were there by the dozens, not the hundreds. So some of us actually cared about the court, but it wasn't enough of us. You know, maybe it's because I've always been uh, you know, I've been a lawyer for the entire time that I was um, a lawyer. Justice ben Ginsburg was on the court, so I always felt very um, attached to her. And just to tag on something that was said in the last answer, uh, it was Justice Ginsburg who said when they were talking about strip searches of teenage girls, the justices were about to say, well, in the totality of circumstances, you can strip search a teenage girl if you have a reasonable suspicion that they might have drugs or contraband. And she said, you've never been yeah. a teenage girl. Think of what it's like to be a teenage girl with your body changing and all the insecurities that you have. It's such a danger zone for, for uh, self-confidence, for anorexia, for all of these things. Uh, think of what it's like um, to be. And so that empathy, that lived experience turned it around or the favorite one, right? She loses the case on, on family leave and then she gets to Justice Ginsburg as an attorney and she gets there as a justice and she rewrites the law and she wins, winning over the vote of Justice Rehnquist. Why? Because times had changed and we had lived different lived experiences, but also his own daughter had gotten divorced and when he had to leave the court early to pick up his kids from daycare, he suddenly understood how important family leave was uh, now that he was taking it uh, from his own job. So again, lived experience matters. As for Merrick Garland, uh, you know, I have some very strong feelings about that. So I will only give you two. One perspective is this, we really wanted a black woman on the court. And there were a number of us who went to the Obama administration and said, we want somebody, give us somebody like Jacqueline Wood, you know, who got, who, you know, you could really get people in the streets to push Republicans on this. We had also had a coalition we had built around Loretta Lynch. Remember how long it took a year to get Loretta Lynch confirmed as US Attorney General. So anyone that thinks, oh, Biden's gonna win, he's gonna have a cabinet, think again, you might have an acting cabinet for a while if we don't win the Senate. So just to put that little, a pin in that little thought. So one of the things was, and Mayor Garland's a man, she's a lovely guy, but we were like, go with youth, go with diversity, because that's what the Republicans do. And they're smart to do that because you're sending a message that representation matters. We really wanted that. And we got, I know that there were finalists and all that, but we got Merrick Garland and he was described at the time as a consensus pick. Yeah. And Obama said, I'm making a consensus pick. And that guy still didn't get a hearing. He yeah. still didn't get a hearing. So the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter, <laughs> apropos of the earlier comment about Democrats not fighting enough, as a Democrat who fights, let me just tell you, we told them, give us someone we can go to the streets for. Give us someone who's diverse and talented and smart, who these people have already elevated twice before, district court and circuit court level, right? And instead they said, no, it's more important that we do a consensus pick that they would vote for. 97 to nothing or whatever it was for Garland the first time. They yeah. wouldn't even give his consensus pick the dignity of a hearing. So that's who they are. Then you have to make a strategic decision. If they're not gonna put this person in anyway, what can I do to get my people out there and motivated to explain to people why this matters? So I hope 
that the whole Merrick Garland, Justice Barrett situation, let's just call it a situation, has forever disabused Democrats of the notion that if you give Republicans consensus, <laughs> that they will come your way, right? Maybe they will and maybe they won't, but Mitch McConnell never will. Individuals will, Republicans will if you control the Senate. But if they have an option between giving the president his due and the courtesy of a hearing, they can vote him down if they want, but the courtesy of a hearing for a judge and not doing that, then, they're, then they are yeah. manipulating the court yeah. to eight seats and we can't let that happen. Yeah, and I, I wanna actually pick up on that because I think Christine and I are, are uh, kindred spirits on this. <laughs> I, I uh, was pushing um, and was organizing to get my friend Sri Srinivasan, um, who is um, uh, now the uh, circuit court uh, judge in, in DC. And uh, I got a call that morning uh, to come to the White House. So from Brian Deese, um, who was leading the process. And so I went and we were doing a meeting uh, with some organizers and groups to uh, talk about uh, the, nom you know, this was right before the president was about to announce. And when they said Merrick Garland, I just remember my stomach dropping because I knew what was gonna happen. It was that nobody on the left was gonna get excited about this, that we weren't gonna be able to organize in the that way we could. We were organizing just because we knew the significance of it, but there wasn't the passion behind it. So that was, you know, I think that that was really, to Christine's point, a problem. Um, and then you saw what happened. I mean, they just dominated us on the, on the narrative, on the organizing, on everything. And, you know, he didn't get a hearing. He barely got an even an interview or meetings uh, when he went up to the Senate. So it was really sad. And I agree with Christine on that. Like, you know, we really do need to learn how to fight and understand what who we're fighting against. Um, someone told me the other day that like, you know, Democrats always have to be the adults in the room, but they said that, you know, when you're an adult and you can't spank the kids or <laughs> yell at the kids and the, the kids are controlling everything, then uh, you know you 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 gotta you gotta understand who you're dealing with. So that's uh, you know, and and I think that that's something that we need to learn. And we've heard learned a lot of hard lessons already on that. And uh, hopefully we've learned by now uh, what we're dealing with. Nick, any any regrets about that? I got to ask you, being inside the administration, about not. I know you were in favor, and then Christine from the outset was in favor. But any regrets about not pushing harder? for not a consensus candidate, but the right candidate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of regrets on that. And I, I think just generally, um, as someone who worked in the White House, especially when we had the Senate, um, a lot of regret around not prioritizing um, the judiciary at all. Uh, you know, we, and there, there, were, it, there was a number of different reasons for it. I mean, you know, when you look back at 2008, uh, what was going on was there was a financial crisis. I mean, you know, they were talking about banks folding, uh, uh, money not being liquid, uh, the car industry collapsing, so many different things happening. So there was an immediate need to deal with some of that stuff. Uh, and then we kind of decided to take on the ACA and, and what Democrats often do um, is focus on policy and, and sort of burn political capital on policy making Whereas Republicans really <clears throat> don't give a shit about that, or sorry, don't care about that. <laughs> and then, um, You're you fine. Know, yeah, <laughs> and and it really just focus in on on judicial nominees, frankly, uh, and and spend a lot of time and energy and, and capital uh, in that. Um, there were some other things, you know, the president uh, Obama's own philosophy was a constitutional uh, uh, scholar and teacher. And he believed in judicial restraint and a balance uh, on the court. Um, Harry Reid, you know, often was a little bit loath to uh, sacrifice floor time towards the end because yeah. he knew it would be filibustered. And then we lost um, uh, Ted Kennedy, who was uh, the, the chair of the Judiciary Committee uh, in 2009. Um, and there were a number of different things like that that I think all contributed to this environment where we ended up leaving a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, seats open, um, and and not really fulfilling and filling those uh, in the way that we should have. 
Christine, you've been kind of working on this from the outset for a long time, as, as you said. What can we as Democrats do to become more aggressive? Nick talked about the Federalist Society before, which was kind of born out of Roe v. Wade and then this, this you know, uh, I'd say focus to bring about Republican initiatives such as limited government, fiscal economics and whatnot. What can we do to become more aggressive on our end in, in pushing on the judicial side? I think there's a couple of things that we can do. And, you know, let me just say, I feel everything that was just said deeply. And it's, <laughs> it's, um, I would think that there were two things. One, healthcare is your personal economy. And I think that we fell for the narrative of you choose healthcare or the economy. No, the mm -hmm. top issue in the streets. I was doing, I had worked in the Clinton Gore administration and then I worked on Capitol Hill as a chief of staff for four years. Um, tried to work on the healthcare issue a lot in Medicare Part D. They, you know, they put in a benefit, didn't pay for it, wasn't complete. They wouldn't let us put in the stuff we wanted then, which would have been a public option. Um, I know because my boss, John Tierney, had the bill, the state's rights to innovate, which at least would let states do, get the automatically get the waiver to do what they wanted in terms of single payer or, or um, Medicare, Medicaid for all, Medi, Medi hybrid like we have in California. But that said, that was the big issue. And everybody, when we did congressional candidate boot camps all over the country with AFSCME members, if it wasn't for the war, the top issue would have been healthcare. It was healthcare all the way. So there was a, and there was also a fight in the labor movement. For a while, the two unions were split, the AFL CIO, and then there was a coalition called Change to Win because the fight was do you get healthcare organizing one big corporate industry at a time? And that was the, uh, change to win people, or do you get it through legislation? And that was the AFL CIO. So that, you know, that and, and the legislation saw argument one. So healthcare was a very big issue. Our issue about healthcare was why are we fetishizing bipartisanship over results? And why aren't we talking about mm -hmm. what this means in the lives of people's personal economy? The other thing I realized when I was writing my book last year about my mom, shameless plug, the Nancy Pelosi way, was <laughs> that one of the things that all Democrats did was we call it the Affordable Care Act, not the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And I talked to some people while I was writing the book. I said, well, why don't we do that? And they said, well, the Republicans were calling it PAPACA. And that was a weird acronym. And I was like, well, so what? We should have owned the acronym because patient protections is still the biggest issue. It's why we lost and it's why we won. And we'll see what happens Tuesday. But the point is we have to fight as if every issue has our health on the line. We figured out how to do that with healthcare over the past four years. We knew that if Hillary won, we'd have to worry about TPA, and preserving Merrick Garland. And if Trump won, we'd be okay on trade because he hated the, the TPA. We had to worry about healthcare and Merrick Garland. So we knew going in, even though we thought there was a 99% chance it was me Hillary, we still had a plan for what if it's Trump. So we fought back all the way. Now, I think people are willing to see that there is a link between healthcare and the judiciary. Because you know what? They were doing legislation on the cheap. Why did they go in and only do judges? Because it's easier to do judges who are gonna curtail your rights, have this small government except for what they get for corporate libertarianism, so let's be clear. The Supreme Court is the Chamber of Commerce. And I said that in predicting that Roberts would uphold LGBTQ equality. And people said, why do you think that? I said, because he's the Chamber of Commerce. And, and they realize that gay people are good for business. I mean, that's, let's just be real about that. So I think if we can link healthcare and the judiciary in an effective way, over the next five days and win. And then keep that momentum going as we build a coalition to do a vigil the night before and the morning of the Supreme Court oral arguments on the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act on November 10th, we can just hardwire into the brain of the American people that your health should be cited by you and not these justices. And not just your right to have birth control or choose the size and timing of your family, but your right to get a cancer screening test. Right. So it has to be more broad. And I think in the shadow of COVID, it's even more important to say COVID's going to be a pre-existing medical condition. Look at all those millions of infections that are out there. Do you want judges to decide how much help you get? Or do you want to be able to have that redress through the political process? And, and uh, that I think would solve a couple of different problems. It would solve the, the false choice between healthcare and the economy. And would also um, solve the false priority of judges or policy because judges are policy. Yeah. And as you alluded to, 
Christine, ironically, the Supreme Court will be hearing on the ACA just days after the election. So very much so pre-planned. Yeah, and, and RJ, let me just say one thing. I wanna reiterate a little bit of what I said earlier, and this will just take a second, but I'm a big believer in infrastructure and organizational independent side building beyond just like these cult of personality uh, politicians. And I think that the Federalist Society and the money that's gone into it and the ruthlessness that they've put behind it in terms of focus, in terms of dollars is one of the, probably the, the key uh, thing in all of this. And, you know, the number I said earlier, and, and I just want people to appreciate this, from 2014 to 2017, they raised $250 million for that organization. Our counterpart, the American Constitution Society, in that period of time's budget was $6 million. So that means that they had $250 million to feed law school students into their indoctrinate them into their system to organ and use that money to organize um, people around nominations to uh, influence the White House, to influence the Senate while we had $6 million. So, you know, that to me is like a, a, a great example of where the priorities are and, and why I think, uh, you know, we need to be a little bit more serious and focused on some of the outside infrastructure building that allows for the organizing, the narrative development, the feeder, the training, the, all of that to go into um, what, we're, what we're talking about. Absolutely, it's, it's a great point, Nick. Um, we do have a viewer question. This comes from Gail Kitsch. Uh, Gail, Gail asks, has, as has been made clear, Republicans seem to grasp the need for ruthlessness, something they learned from loss along with an appreciation for playing the long game to get power at any cost. On the other hand, how does one balance the values most Democrats hold dear with the demands of ruthlessness? Uh, Christine, let's just start off. Well, there's a meme going around that said, we are ruthless, <laughs> act accordingly. Well so, done. <laughs> nice. Let me just say that. Second of all, let me just say, when I wrote my first uh, was putting together my first manual for what we called campaign boot camps. So it was interesting. It was a time during the war. There was a lot of liberals who didn't even like the term boot camp because they thought it was too militant. Um, now we're all so I mean, just in terms of telling you where the mindset was. Right? Do we even want to? Do we want to talk about training and campaign and these tough language? Like, well, I did. Anyway, I went to go interview Republicans because I interviewed Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and said, "How would you? How would you fly this plane?" The Republicans actually had a manual that they used in 1994 to take back the House, and they called it "flying upside down." And they said, "Being a congressional candidate in the minority trying to take over is like flying an airplane upside down. You have to do everything, but you have to do it upside down because the currents, the wind speeds, the directions are all being shaped by." Um, the majority and the incumbent you're trying to take out. So it was really interesting to get into the mindset of where Republicans were. So I went to go interview some people for the book, um, including George Will, who was my friend from baseball. Um, now, of course, now we have more in common in politics, but then we were definitely not. But I asked him, I said, how do you all do this? He said, after Goldwater lost, there were a handful of families that started these institutions, Heritage, Cato, you know, Federalist Society in the early, late 60s, early 70s, they were building, they were opposing liberal academe. One of the things that they would always do when they try to put people on TV, they always wanted to be debating professors because that was a sign to their base, right? But they also gave them a, a, an academic credential. So you might remember, for example, that when John Kerry was doing a debate about the war in 1972, you know, he was debating a uh, a, a scholar. Uh, when they wanted to take down someone, they put a professor on one of their shows and, you know, really go after them. But they thought the entire, the entire ju academic system was liberal academe and they, and that was already going to be churning out all of these people, would that we were so organized, right? It was going to be churning out all of these people and thought leaders and, and judges and legislators and litigators and all that. And so their response was to build up this other pipeline system. And they did it focused, intentional. They were the ones that went to Ronald Reagan when he was offered the vice presidency and said, don't take it, don't take it. We want you to run next time. So Bob Dole took it, ran with Ford and lost to Carter. But they said to him, and they would say, there was a time after um, Jimmy Carter won when people said, 
are you, you we lost to these guys come on you should have told ronald reagan ronald reagan we could have won and they said nope wait we're playing the long game we've been playing the long game since 1964 mm -hmm. four more years and then we have it and they did so we have to understand that that budget that quarter billion dollar budget didn't just arrive out of nowhere mm -hmm. uh, on the on the conservative corporate libertarian side it drew from two places corporate money and far right wing evangelical support which frankly as we know from the statistics these people don't even know what's going on in their own families and their own bedrooms um but nevertheless that's what it was about and that's what it was built upon so when we talk about repairing the breach it's not just going to be about saying well if biden wins let's go back in and rehire all those uh or, or hire new uh empower new inspectors generals to do a full audit on everything they looted on their way out the door also because you know the austerity people are going to come right back <laughs> both parties are going to come back in and say we can't afford this so we're gonna have to say this is how deep the hole is let's be clear because that was the other problem we had in 09 remember we had an omnibus we had an auto bailout and we had the tarp all happening at the same time that was a lot of money that was spent out and it wasn't felt by people on Main Street nearly enough. And so therefore, we have to be really clear. This is the hole we're in. This is the number we have to backfill, number one. Number two, we better understand that they're not going away. That endowment is there. They can print up as many checks as they want. So we're not going to beat them in numbers. But we have to have at least enough money to compete. And again, enough orientation to compete um, to say, we need to have grassroots participation in this. People need to make sure they need to go to every single U.S. senator and say, you know what, there's a grassroots community in your state that wants to be part of your judicial nomination process. We want to have access to that. We want representation on that from our groups. We want to be a part of this dialogue, a part of this conversation. So we have to, I would say Democrats, we have to little d democratize our politics more. We have to open some of the doors that we leave closed. We have to open some of that information um, so that where we are doing the organizing work and where we do have a, you know, a foothold into these, these uh, communities that we are bringing more people into that room. Because I personally believe that we actually have the majority on this. And when you explain to people that judges just like everybody else ought to be reflective of their communities, that they say, well, that makes sense. And you say, just like when you're on a jury, you know, don't you think that you should have a jury of your peers, right? If you're, if you need to go to court, don't you think it's important that there's someone in the courtroom that looks like you other than the court reporter and maybe the bailiff, right? Um, I think they get that. But remember, this has been going on since 1964. They've been playing the long game and they were willing to lose in order to win. And so we have to understand that we can't go back and just fight a little bit harder. We have to be tough. Yeah, and I, and and that really, I, Christine really articulated exactly what what I was going to say. And and when I mean ruthlessness, I mean discipline. They're ruthlessly disciplined, and where they focus is is in very clever ways. They they understand, I think, power a little bit differently than we do. Um, since the '70s, as Christine '60s, since Christine mentioned, I mean, they've developed this really elegant set of organizations and institutions that end up. Um, allowing for this environment to to occur, you know, they have uh, on the state side they have groups like Alec, the State Policy Network, uh, um, uh, groups like that. They have organizations that do the organizing, like Americans for Prosperity. They partner with the NRA, the Christian Conservatives. They have the Federalist Society on the court side, and they have all of them aligned towards uh, and highly capitalized towards advancing their particular goals that they then combine that with their electoral and, and policymaking strategies with their elected officials. We are very disjointed in that um, same uh, regard. And you know, sometimes the left hand's not talking to the right hand. Often Democrats focus on cycle, electoral cycles more than we do on the infrastructure building side. And so what I think we need to do uh, is, is again, be ruthless in terms of how we fight, but also ruthless in terms of how we discipline ourselves and understand power in the country. Excellent, thank you both on that. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Justice Ginsburg, uh, affectionately known as the notorious RBG. 
<laughs> by the way, that is a great documentary. I want to I want to throw that plug out there as well. Um, we'll start with, uh, with Nick on this one. Um, what did she mean to the court and her, what was her greater impact in your mind on society and, and, and as a jurist in general? So I actually want to defer to Christine on this. I've heard Christine talk about this and she will do it justice in a way that I, 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 I will add on to what she says, but Christine, I, I'll defer to you on this one and, and let you sort of take the first uh, uh, piece of this because you're, you're incredible in terms of how you're, you articulate it. Well, that's just because what you're trying to say is I'm a fangirl and that's okay because yeah. I am. <laughs> but let me say this, when I was uh, in law school, uh, at a state law school in the early 90s, um, I was interning for a place called Public Advocates when uh, Thurgood Marshall announced that um, his departure from the court and then we were gonna be stuck with um, <sighs> Clarence Thomas. And I went through all the jurisprudence to figure out where you know, four, five to four, one way was gonna go five to four, the other way. It was before RBG. So I had a fairly good idea of what the court was going to do um, with a Bush appointee, even before Anita Hill came forward, just in terms of what this was going to mean. Um, and, um, and then in looking afterwards at what happened with changes, uh, you know, one thing that uh, Thurgood Marshall talked about a lot was the need and the power to dissent. And, 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 and he even gave a very famous speech in defense of dissents. And, uh, and it was really uh, significant because he was the person who was always there in those small towns when it was time to start to litigate. He was always the person who had the courage to go into these towns where a black person had been killed or a black person had been lynched, a black person had been denied opportunity. And he would show up to sue and it was like, you know, the cavalry in the good sense was coming and the hope that he gave people. So for him to become a dissenter, you know, a lot of people said to him, as I still say to African-Americans today, which I'm sure you can agree is, why don't you just build consensus? Why are you, why are you being a fighter? Like, no, he was a fighter. And my favorite story is when he was in the hospital and Nixon had asked for his medical records and uh, he just wrote, not yet on the file. Mm. Um, so, you know, like, nice try, bud. But he knew, he's being ruthless, he knew. So he, I think he'd instilled a role for someone on the court to be the dissenter. But when Ruth Bader Ginsburg first got there, she was more of a uniter. She came on in 93. Um, she was a, um, she was someone who had lived the experience that of so many, not only women, but people of color who had been done so well in law school, but couldn't get a job, who did the things that they tell you to do academically, but then that didn't translate into respect professionally. And actually she worked with the ACLU and the Women's Vote, the Women's Project project to go out and litigate these cases. And she was very smart in saying, we have to have men's equality in order to have women's equality and that we're liberating everyone, not just one gender. And I think that that was so significant. And when you look at the cases that she won and then her going to the court and stitching together these victories for people, they were really based in redefining we the people as meaning all of us and making sure everyone was involved in that. It wasn't until 2000, Bush versus Gore, the infamous case mentioned earlier, that she said, I dissent instead of I respectfully dissent. And all of a sudden she was stepping into the shoes of Thurgood Marshall. Again, years after, seven years after she got on the court, but nevertheless, that's when she started following the Thurgood Marshall um, in defense of dissents and really laying those things down. And, and what gives me hope is this, when we had the ceremony at the US Capitol, and it was such an honor to get to be there. Um, I actually made a point of sitting under the statue of Rosa Parks, who was the only other woman who lay uh, in public repose at the Capitol. Uh, Rosa Parks, as a, as a private citizen, was lying in um, was lying in honor, and 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 Justice Ginsburg, being a public official, was lying in state. But nevertheless, the only other woman to have that honor, and uh, feeling the history, feeling all of it, all of it. And then uh, we went outside at the end and watched as the casket was brought down the steps and the women members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, House and Senate were the honor guard. And then they all waved goodbye one last time when the hearse went into, uh, the coffin went into the hearse. And it was such a sad moment. And a woman next to me was crying and she said, what's next for our country? Uh, what's gonna happen to our country? And I said, we're gonna fight. And we're going to win because that's what she would want us to do. And we have to swing the pendulum. 
And the broader story of that is remember how you felt after 2004. Remember how you felt when a selected president became an elected president, when it, we didn't even have marriage equality or Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act to defend. We didn't even have that progress to defend. And we were in the middle of this war. That was a war of choice built on a lie. All of those things, so demoralizing. And a woman sued because someone had slipped a note under her door and said, by the way, all these years you've been a manager with these guys, you've been paid 40% less than them. And she got mad and she sued and Goodwill, uh, her boss said, so what? You should have, you should have uh, sued when the discrimination started if you thought it was discrimination. And it goes all the way up to the court and the court agrees and Ginsburg gives rights the dissent and says, Lily Ledbetter didn't know she was getting shortchanged. How could she possibly have sued? Congress fix this. And you know what? We elected a Democratic House and Senate. We elected a Democratic president. And the first bill that was prepared for Barack Obama to sign, and the first bill he signed was the Lily Ledbetter law. The dissent of Ginsburg became the law of the land. So today, as we're being ruthless, let's remember. Tuesday is our opportunity to start swinging the pendulum. That's what Ruth would tell us to do. She would tell us, and I can just affectionately call her Ruth, um, the mm -hmm. justice would tell us to do. She would say, write your dissent, get ready. You know who they are. You know what they're going to do to you. So you get ready to fix it. And if they knock this down on, on after hearing the oral arguments on November 10th, you just come back with a bigger and better bill but you make sure that your responsibility isn't to be in despair. And boy, do I say a prayer for Kagan and Sotomayor and Breyer. Imagine being the three of them dealing with all of this, right? But we need to be writing those dissents speaking to a future age as Ginsburg taught us. And I think that's also part of being ruthless is saying be thoroughly disciplined yeah. in writing the laws, taking those dissents, and turning them around and saying, I'm gonna elect a legislative majority while I'm waiting to fix the courts and that's gonna be a long repair. I can do two things at the same time. And I think that is the greatest gift that Ginsburg gave us, that in a time of despair, she went from being a consensus builder to being a consensus dissenter sending clear signals about how we could repair the breach in our own way. Don't just mourn what happened at the court, organize in the legislature to fix it. Nick? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, uh, everything Christine said, which is why I wanted her to go first, because it, it's just beautiful how she describes it and, and talks about it. And one thing I do want to say though, is, is the, you know, we often talk about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a, as a role model for, for young women, uh, which is very, very true. But I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about, um, you know, my sons and what it means to them. You know, they, I sat with them uh, and we watched the documentary. You know, we, I've talked to them about, about uh, her and the legacy and you know what they they're, they're nine so they don't fully grasp everything but you know what they understand is this woman who you know at a time when uh, you know misogyny when uh, and, and it's still going on now uh, discrimination against women was just sort of normal um, she came into the scene and everything she did based on her descent based on her language based on her fighting. I mean, she was a trailblazer even when she was in law school, even when she was young uh, for women. And to understand what was normal uh, then, what continues to be normal now in terms of misogyny mm -hmm. and everything else. Uh, and for my boys to understand that, the, that this woman set the standard for what it means to fight against that and to push back against that, um, I think is also important as a role model to, to young boys as well. And, and um, I'm hoping to impart some of that on, on my sons. And, and I think that there's an opportunity to do the same uh, with, with young men and, and boys everywhere as well. Very well put by both of you. Thank you. Um, speaking of the consensus dissents that Christine brought up there, there's a number of them. And one, one stood out to me in particular, I wanted to get Christine's take on this one. This was Gonzalez versus Carhart decided in 2007. Christine knows exactly where, where I'm going with this. The court upheld Congress's Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act of 2003. It was the first time the court had banned a specific abortion method and the first time it did not include an exception for the woman's health. 
according to the Washington Post. In her dissent, the court, Justice Ginsburg stated, the court deprives women of the right to make an autonomous choice, even at the expense of their safety. This way of thinking reflects ancient notions about women's place in the family and under the constitution, ideas that have long since been discredited. Christine, please talk about that a little bit and kind of how that goes to her lifelong commitment specifically uh, towards the protection of the equal rights of women. Well, Justice Ginsburg, when she was attorney Ginsburg was very clear about the fact that women had an equal role to play in, at every level of society. And again, this was someone who simply said, I should be given a chance. She didn't go around saying, I did better than all of these jokers. Why'd you hire them and not me? She said, no, you know, this is the way, this is the way forward is to prove your worth, to build coalitions together, to find people who are going to listen to you and to educate them piece by piece, respecting that that may be their religious view, that may be their spiritual view, that may be what they do in their own lives. But there's a difference between the personal life of a judge and the civic life of the society that he or she is being asked uh, to rule on. And I think that it's really important uh, to make sure that, that on the one hand, you look at the values of whatever your faith is or whatever your morality is, however you define your ethics and say, this is what I bring to service. But also if you have pride in your own beliefs, then you should also make room that other people have pride in their own beliefs, even if they are different from yours. And so the question isn't one of natural law as defined by your catechism, as we Catholics would call it. It is what is the law and justice of the United States of America. And when it comes to uh, the issue of, of a woman's right to control her own body, again, to her character, Justice Ginsburg said that at her confirmation hearing. <laughs> she knew it could be a deal breaker. She said it anyway. So what does that tell you about her level of courage? After all that she did to get to that place, after everything that was riding on her and the president for having chosen her over other people who might be more quote unquote artful, um, in their descriptions of things, she was very plain spoken. This is what you're gonna get. You're going to get somebody who believes in autonomy. And again, it's a false choice to say, we're gonna talk about reproductive freedom and we're gonna talk about economics. No, reproductive freedom is your economics. Because if you don't have the ability to choose the size and timing of your family, and if you don't have paid family leave to care for that family when you make the choice to have that child, then you don't have freedom. You don't have liberty or an economy. So as a practical matter, I think it was really significant and important for the justice to go to enter the court with integrity. I think that mattered to her. And in a lot of the interviews that she gave, especially in later years when they would say, but the game is really, uh, and it was a game, it was not to say things. And she would say, no, people had the right to know yeah. what they were getting. Okay, that's one. Two, as to that dissent in particular, it spoke so deeply to people because any woman who's been pregnant and has decided uh, to uh, have the baby, by the time you're in the third trimester, you've been through, you hope, the worst of the morning sickness, you've been through the what they call the golden trimester, the middle trimester, and now you're at the point where you're having the baby shower, you're, you're, you're literally picking out curtains or clothes or names, you're, you're accommodating your family and your work situation for this new person, you have these very suddenly very new and intimate relationships with potential caregivers and all of that, you're on a path. This is a, this is, you're on a path. And when you're told that, that this isn't going to happen, it is such a shattering experience. Yes, there are the very, very, very rare cases where somebody's in their third trimester and finds out that they're pregnant. But by and large, 90, over 99% of the time, this is a wanted child. This is a loved child. This is a prepared for child. And then you find out when your dreams are absolutely shattered. And then on top of that, when you find out that you could die yeah. if, you, if you do not um, take care of this situation and this child that is not going to, that is endangering you and you have to make a choice about living yourself, that is again, an agonizing decision. This should be made between you and your doctor and your faith or ethics and your family. 
That's the choice. That's where those decisions are being made. To inject the government in that decision is just, it's not only wrong, it's heartless because the government is saying you can't do it and you're a bad person for doing it. And you're a bad mother if you won't sacrifice your life for a child that's not going to live anyway. That doesn't, it, it, what it does to shame women, what it does to treat them as a mere vessel of the, um, of the child who is, is, is they're going to feel so guilty anyway so guilty anyway for the situation, those feelings of guilt that come up of what could I have done differently? What should I not have done? Did I eat the wrong thing? Did I drink the wrong thing? Did I, did I do something to cause this? All of those things are already there. And again, I don't care what people tell you. You talk to a pregnant woman in her third trimester, complete, a certain level, complete paranoia of, I can't do anything wrong. Now it's time to get this baby out healthy. That's the lived experience that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had and having her own children. That's the experience that she knew women had over and over and over again. The court had those records in front of them and yet still said, Congress can pass this bill. All the legislative history said, we're doing it on ideology, we're not doing it for health reasons. And that was the most egregious thing of all, was that the legislative history was sitting right there in front of them, proving that it was about ideology and not science and ignoring the life of the mother and therefore violating the tenet of liberty for the mother. And that is unconstitutional. And that is what Ruth Bader Ginsburg was fighting. And that's why that's such a, a, a brave dissent that she wrote. And it was such an empowering dissent that she wrote because she gave these women back their humanity, even in dissent. Absolutely. As, as a follow-up to both of you, uh, Christian, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, with this new 6-3 block, how much danger do you think Roe v. Wade is in of being reversed? Well, I'm gonna say something a little <laughs> perhaps different. I think they're less likely to overturn Roe versus Wade than they are to chip away at access. It's effectively overturned if you can't afford it. It's effectively overturned if you can't access this. That's why they try these trap laws. And ridiculous, they understand like these laws that say you have to have an admitting privilege at a hospital in order to nearby a hospital in order to perform an abortion. No, you don't. And they don't do that. Um, I, you know, again, I work, <laughs> I work in policy for many years and do a lot of work with veterans. A lot of times veterans go to community health clinics. There are a lot of times people in America go to community cl health clinics, not hospitals and doctors perform procedures in those community health clinics all the time, even though they don't have admitting privileges at the nearby hospital. So let's understand that they're making an exception to community health clinics um, when it comes to abortion services that they don't make for other much more invasive surgeries and procedures. But they're doing that because they'll effectively say, well, it's legal, but you can't access it if you only have one uh, women's health clinic in your state um, or no uh, women's health clinics in your state. And this particularly falls hard on black and brown communities, which is why you see many black women, so many Latinas who are organizing around um, these efforts to push back on reproductive uh, justice. But second, I think that when you look at, will they find this case that specifically says um, Roe v. Wade must be overturned, I don't think the court does that because then it would go state to state to state to state. And they know that as a practical matter, what would happen is people would just figure out ways to get to those states, which we're already doing, funding states that have uh, the procedure. I think it's much more likely that they would deny any government services or care for people who need those services. And that I think they would do. I also think that they would, would strike down um, third trimester abortions because that seems to be the direction in which they are going if it is crafted in such a way that does protect um, the health of the mother. Um, I think that they would probably, again, they don't re take the temperature, but they read the atmosphere. I think you might have a rape incest um, life of the mother exception, but I do think that again, without a corrective, that part of Roe versus Wade is gone. I think that it's more likely that they'll overturn it again. They'll chip it away to make it essentially unattainable as a right for, for poor women. And that's what we have to be concerned about. The other thing that I think that they will do, frankly, in terms of, of, of our rights and our health is I think that they will um, chip away 
at um, any efforts to take on climate action. Remember, Justice Barrett's father was a Shell Oil lawyer for many, many years. And even though Shell was listed as one of the conflict um, litigants on her circuit court application, she didn't put that in her Supreme Court application. And she said, when asked um, by um, our hopefully future Vice President Kamala Harris about climate, you know, she, 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 reiterated the response she'd given the day before and said, I'm not a client scientist and it's not settled. So again, this is the Chamber of Commerce, uh, addict, George W. Bush would say addicted to oil uh, majority. And I think that we are likely to see a lot of action against efforts to aggressively fight, fight climate change in the Supreme Court. And what that means is that you will have more environmental health dangers to women, including to pregnant women. You'll have more deep birth, uh, you know, birth defects and unfortunately the technology to find out about them sooner. So again, it'll, in their actions to stop us from fighting the, the pollution and global warming impact on women's reproductive health, we will end up with um, more instances where women who find out, who suffer from that economic and environmental degradation, who then have a problem um, with the child they're carrying, and then they would be unable to, to make a decision in favor of their own health in that third trimester if that's when they find out. Yeah, yeah. As, as Christine was talking, especially about um, you know the, the ability to choose uh, the dissent, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dissent was ringing in my ear. You know, this way of thinking reflects ancient notions about women's place in the family and under the constitution. And unfortunately, uh, that is where I think this court uh, and conservatives want to take us. I mean, you know, it's interesting to me, this whole Amy Coney Barrett um, nomination and, and her sort of place on the court you know, she's benefited so much personally from the women's uh, liberation movement and, and women's uh, rights movement. And the uh, extension of that or a part, a, a massive part of that is a woman's ability to make decisions on what she can and cannot do with her body or wants to do with her body. And the fact that she doesn't recognize that or the current, um, that, that she's not sort of reflective of that uh, is really bothersome to me, you know, and 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 I think um, uh, sort of a, a little bit of a tragedy uh, in in many ways. Um, and I think Christine though is right on the on the on the issue that they will probably chip at, away at it so much so that it, it's it's nearly impossible. Which is why I think the states will have a massive role in shoring up and and in places like Virginia where we're at, other places, um, you know, where we have democratic control of legislatures. We should make it a priority to enshrine in, the, in our constitution uh, the women's uh, a woman's ability to to choose, uh, just to protect it, at least in our in our state here in Virginia, and hopefully other states will follow because um, it will be very volatile. I think uh, with the way the court is currently, and if we can shore that up uh, at the state level, we should absolutely do that. Yeah, both good points. Um, I know we're running short on time, but I wanted to get to uh, another audience question and, and finish out with one of my own. Uh, Jonathan Adelston asks, what can mere non-attorney citizens who don't hold any appointed or elected office do to help beyond voting and contributing time and money to campaigns? Uh, Nick, you can start us off on that one. And Christine, I'd like to hear from you too. Well, I think, I mean, a, a couple things are, you know, seeking out, and, and again, I'm going, I'm going back to this um, independent side infrastructure building, mm -hmm. um, organizations that are doing good work in your community, and, and it is volunteering and it is contributing, but also there's other ways of supporting, you know, there's a lot of these folks have young, or organizations have young executive directors in them, or young uh, people that are part of it, and being a mentor, and, and as someone who's a lawyer, uh, also contributing uh, legal services um, and making connections that way, I think would be uh, an important contribution. I think it's important too. Um, I'm really much a, a very much a believer in in working in your own communities and sort of sharing the right uh, message and narratives and and not ceding ground. I think that having conversations locally in your synagogue and your church. Uh, at your community center, in the barbershop, wherever you're at, about what's going on and sort of imparting that sort of knowledge and your perspective can help break through some of the um, stranglehold that they have on, 
on um, national media and things like that as well. Um, and organizing yourself locally and, and talking locally about these issues and things that matter, um, I think can help sort of expand the circles of knowledge uh, uh, in your community that can maybe help contribute. And then really getting involved locally in your city council and, and, um, and communities in, in, in whatever ways you can plug in, either through the law, through your time and effort, um, I think will really help lift all boats. So that's, that's sort of how I would think about it. I think that's exactly right. The other element that I would add is, you know, I think that some, I think back to some of my early days as a board member for a group called Legal Services for Children. This is why I was still in law school. We were teaching a street law class uh, funded by the Nickel Foundation and we um, were teaching in uh, middle schools, teaching kids their legal rights. You know, everything from, you know, if they see your backpack and they, you know, can they search it? Can they search it without calling your parents? You know, some of the basic things, like what happens when you're on the bus and a cop, you know, here's a fight and wants to round you all up and talk about it. You know, stuff like that, that basic, you know, now my daughter's in sixth grade, but you know, a sixth grader, an 11, 12 year old would need to know. And I think that that, you know, is really important um, because it was that kind of, you know, one classroom at a time informing people of their rights. My grand, I was a law student, I wasn't a lawyer, but there are plenty of teaching opportunities like that. And when I became um, a trial attorney, one of the things that we would often say is that we were changing hearts and minds, 12 people at a time, saying that yes, prostitutes can get raped, saying that yes, um, your husband, um, hits you, you're still with him, but you want the judicial system to tell him that he shouldn't hit you anymore. Um, and that's why you should, you should convict someone of domestic violence, even though their wife and they are sitting in the courtroom together. It, 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 you know, her forgiveness is not the absolution. The law has to make a decision about that. Uh, getting involved with um, groups, whether it's and on anything that you care about. Again, for me, it was uh, vulnerable people, particularly women and children. And um, so for me, it made more sense to see my advocacy, but it's still rooted in that as I as I am counsel for We Said Enough, which was the group that started the uh, Me Too politics aspect of the Me Too movement in Sacramento, California. You know, I'm still getting complaints every week from people um, who are being uh, mistreated in politics. And again, it takes one office at a time, one campaign at a time. But I do feel that my work on the national level, my work as a national advocate is only as legitimate as the last you know, phone call I took on the hotline or the last phone bank that I did in my community or the last march that I did, although I'm doing less marching now, unfortunately due to COVID, but you have to be close. And so you are one of those people who's informing that narrative. And it does matter if you go out and decide that you want to march for climate or you want to march for for equal rights or you want to um, be part of a community or a club that's doing their endorsing for these candidates who come to you and ask you for your support. So it it is important because that's what builds up the infrastructure. Then you're a group part of a group of people like minded people working on an issue who say we're bringing you expertise from the field. And most good legislation, just like most good law, starts off in these pilot projects right? Yeah. It starts off because a few people are saying, we want to be a model for something. So find the thing you care about, answer that call to service. What is your why? What is your purpose? And then figure out a way to do what we call the inside outside. On the inside, go hard. You know, you're a crisis center hotline operator. You're a volunteer in a school. You do that. You do that volunteer work that gives you that credential. And then the outside, being part of an opportunity to then share that with your member of Congress at a town hall meeting or with a national group when they're looking for input on where to go because policy is ultimately about people. And just as there are a handful of people who decided in 1964 that with Goldwater losing, the thing they were gonna do was to take on the entire academic uh, system because they felt it was turning out Democrats um, because once people knew about their rights and opportunities in liberal arts, they would vote to perpetuate opportunity for other people to experience and enjoy them. We also have to start in these small little rooms and say, where does this make a difference? We're all striking for climate because one girl, you know, Greta uh, stood outside and, and struck for climate on a Friday. We're all, you know, it, it really does just take one person here, one person there. I'm doing, we said enough because one woman, Adama Iwu, got mad at being sexually harassed in the middle of a conversation about Harvey Weinstein. Who does that? 
Well, the wrong person, because look what it did. 900 laws later, thousands of volunteer actions later, here we are. And the other thing I would say is right now, the personal storytelling around public health and around COVID and around how we get through that will take all of our voices. Because sometimes we're so caught up in the national that we forget we have to tell this one story at a time. Why are black and brown children dying of COVID? More than white children? Why are native communities being decimated by COVID? Why is it there are these racial disparities? Is it because they tend to get uh, healthcare in a, in a clinic and not a hospital? Is it because they don't go to that wellness visit? They're on the other side of the visual divide. They can't do telehealth in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know, but we better find out. And you can help us find out. Why is it that we're not opening up safely? What steps can we take to feed people in the meantime while schools are still closed, like the public schools in my community? Why is it that things are the way they are? And what can you be doing locally to help answer those questions and advocate for them? So I would say do the, loss, the local thing that gives you the feeling of, of gratification and impact, and then do the part of a larger group. Take that Take that experience as your testimonial to your lawmakers. There's always an opportunity. There's always a hearing at your state capitol or virtually now um, to make your voice heard. But I think if you do that grounded in your own experience with people, that that's how you start to make a mark, you start to make an impact because then you have facts and objective data for people to look at that counters the narrative that number one, people don't care because they do care. And number two, that quote unquote, no one's talking about this. It's not that no one's talking about it, it's that you can't hear it because those voices are being silenced. Right. So help make your own media in that regard. Uh, one, one, one just quick thing, RJ, um, just uh, we're entering a, a period of time, I think that is, uh, uh, you know, hopefully not gonna be this way, but I'm afraid may be dangerous um, in terms of our democracy and where the election is going and what Donald Trump might do or might not do. And so, you know, a lawyer, especially right now, um, helping with election protection, uh, just being available and plugged in locally and nationally to a lot of the efforts that'll be going on um, in the courts and outside of the courts, you know, people, if, if he, you know, calls into the question the election, we're going to have to hit the streets. We have to give Joe Biden cover not to um, not to uh, give up uh, and and not to call the election. You know, he we have to be in the streets if that if if if, if there's any kind of question um, because we can't have what happened in 2000 happen this time. Uh, and so, I think there will be some immediate opportunities, unfortunately, um, to to plug in. I agree, great advice. And, and it goes back to that old saying, all politics is local. So that's that's where it starts. Um, final question, I couldn't let you both get away without talking about winning for RBG. So I know you, both of you have, have been heavily involved, have given your heart and soul to it in, in the interest of full disclosure. I'm, I'm involved as well, not to the degree that both of you have been passionately uh, from the beginning. Uh, Christine, talk, uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, after uh, the justice died, uh, there were a number of us who were connected through our friend Ben, who said, you know, I, I have the domain win it for RBG. I thought it would be important for us to utilize that in some way. And having um, the unique experience of both being an RBG fangirl and uh, the daughter of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who was putting on the public uh, house and capital remembrances in, in consultation with uh, the Ginsburg family, um, I knew that they wanted her legacy to be her work. They were very upset about, you know, the granddaughter being attacked on national television by Donald Trump. Um, they did not want this to be a partisan remembrance. And so win it for RBG, of course, for me as a Democrat, I know what to do. But um, the idea was that we would have billboards around the country and t-shirts and a message that says, if you want to win something in the spirit of RBG, which means two things. First of all, it's what you would want us to get out there and fight for. And so it was important that it was not done in a partisan way, but it, uh, you know, it, from an issue standpoint. But second of all, swing that pendulum. That's what that means. We're gonna win this election for RBG, then, then we're gonna get about organizing to undo the harm, to swing the pendulum. We'll find that equivalent of the Lily Ledbetter dissent, and there's probably a bunch of them, and try to turn those into law. 
and we'll have that vigil at the Supreme Court um, on November 10th in a virtual vigil the night before all around the country. What we'll be saying to people, these are the, you know, now we're in whatever situation we're in, but we know they are going, they're coming for your health care. We have to win that health care back and win it for RBG and do it as she always says, fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that inspires others to join you. So we hope everyone will join us. Hashtag win it for RBG or go to the website or look at our beautiful um, swag, but also the, the, the quotes from RBG because those that's the lasting change. It's not just about one election. It's not even just about one court decision. It's about the lasting change that we could make and, 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 and to remind them we're not going away. Yeah. You might be six to three because you had some court jamming by the Republicans, but guess what? The Democrats are going to win the majority vote on Tuesday for the president. They're going to win the majority vote for the House of Representatives on Tuesday. We represent the majority. And as Joe Biden says, that means we represent everybody, including the people that don't vote with us. So that's the it that we have to win, that sense of we the people are united and connected. And we may disagree, but we have to, fighting for equality means that everybody has an opportunity. And, and you know, ask yourself, what would Ruth think? How would Ruth want us to act? Ruth less in community with respect and dignity and equality for people. That's what she would want. And that's what we hope to deliver. Yes. Uh, Nick, anything to add? No, that was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Very eloquently put, Christine. Very, very good way to, to end here. Um, I wanna thank you both for joining us today for this timely and much needed discussion. Uh, everyone go check out hashtag win it for RBG and everyone who hasn't voted, please go vote. Bottom line, it's where change happens. Thank you both, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, happy election day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, happy voting everyone. <laughs>